Thank you very much, Mrs. Howard. Any town meeting members who have yet to be sworn in? No new town meeting members. All right, let's do our test vote. Get your clickers out. Soon as Mr. Lathwood is ready. Okay. Is corn the most produced crop in the world? One for yes, two for no. Is corn the most produced crop in the world? One for yes, two for no. Do they grow more corn than anything else? One for yes, two for no. Go ahead and vote. These guys work hard on these questions. Got a tally? Ah, the answer is yes. Crop corn is number one, wheat is number two, and rice is third. So now we have ge geography, geology, and social studies for you guys to study up on. <laughs> wheat and then rice. Miss Mahan. It is moved that if all the business of the meeting is set forth in the warrant for the annual town meeting is not disposed of at this session, when the meeting adjourns, it adjourns to Wednesday, May 18th, 2016 at 8 p.m. All in favor, please say yes. yes. Opposed? No. Okay, then let's finish up. Uh, announcements and resolutions. Mr. O'Connor. James O'Connor, member of the Town Meeting Procedures Committee in Precinct 19. I simply had a question that I'd like to ask the moderator to pull the sense of the meeting. We have organizational meetings to elect the clerk and the chair of each precinct. And for some precincts, it's on the fourth meeting. Hopefully next year, we'll be out of here in four meetings. But who knows when we'll be out. But the thought I had is because many precincts have organizational meetings prior to um, town meeting where they you know, get together with their precincts and there's members of the quorum fulfilled there or we could have it on the first night. But um, I was told that we always did it this way. That's why we always do th three nights, seven per group because it might be too many people trying to elect on one night. So. Um, Mr. Moderator, could you ask the meeting whether we'd like to have it earlier or on the first night of town meeting so we could have a chair elected on the first night? All in favor of doing it on the first night from here on out, say yes. Yes. Opposed? Good. <laughs> Miss Madam Clerk, can you make that happen next year? She'll make that happen. And if you haven't organized yet, do so out here. Um, <laughs> In case you hadn't heard, uh, Governor Baker has signed the special legislation put forth last year under Article 15 of our annual town meeting to put the Director of Assessments and the Assessor's Office under the supervision of the town manager. These changes are now part of the Town Manager Act. Um, the bill was implemented with the help of Senator Donnelly, who co-sponsored with Sean Garbley and Dave Rogers. And I understand... Uh, Okay, so the governor then approved it. So what we did last year actually passed, and now it's all under Adam's capable hands. Good luck. <laughs> uh, any other reports of committee? Any other announcements? None. Reports of committees? None. Mr. Tosti? Move that Article 3 be laid upon the table. All in favor of laying Article 3 upon the table, please say yes. yes. Opposed? Article 3 is on the table. Last week, we may be, we're not sure, we may have not taken Articles 35 through 42 off the table, so we're just going to do it now. Move that Articles 35 through 42 be taken off the table. All in favor, please say yes. yes. 
Opposed? Those are off the table and we're back into the budgets. Inspections. Someone wanted to talk about inspections. Who was it? Ah, Mr. Revelock. Uh, good evening, Steve Revelock, Precinct 1, 111 Sunnyside Avenue. Um, the inspe inspectional services has a database of permits that you can uh, examine through the town website. Uh, is this better? Okay. Inspectional services has a data, keeps a database of uh, permits that um, one can access through the town's website. And looking through the permit database, I noticed that um, in 2015, the town issued uh, 2,008 building permits, uh, 1,327 electrical permits, and another 1,794 uh, permits for gas and plumbing work. Uh, so which, if you think, if you break that down into, yeah, those are big numbers, and if you break them down into 40 hours a week, 52 weeks a year, that's a building permit every 62 minutes, an electrical permit every 94 minutes, and a gas and plumbing permit every 69 minutes. Uh, Mr. Moderator, do you happen to know if 2015 was an unusually busy year for building permits? Mr. Byrne, can you tell me? Um, actually, Steve, I have the from 2007 here, but um, it has trend, been trending up. Um, it's the more the more of there's more complex projects as well, mm -hmm. but uh, it is it is going up. Yes. Thanks. My my reason for asking was, um, you know, I, I think the the role of inspectional services is I think inspectional services has an important role to play, and I'm just wondering. Um, do you guys have the resources that you, do you feel like you have the resources that you need? Um, yeah, yeah, I think yes, we do. We, 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 we actually this year we have increased a little bit on, on um, the temporary staffing uh, to help us with with inspections when it gets very busy. Okay. But uh, yes, we, we we do the best we can. Yeah, but we're okay. Okay. Thanks. Well, that's all I wanted to know. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else on inspections? Seeing none. Education. Mr. Tosti. Finance Committee has a new recommendation um, on two articles. The first one is Article 35, the education budget. It was produced on a one-page sheet last, uh, actually it might have been a couple of days ago, um, a couple of meetings ago. What this does, is um, when the budgets were being uh, put together, the manager uh, through the long-term planning committee and then trying to come to a compromise and agreement uh, through the long-term planning committee with the school department uh, made an agreement, which the finance committee has uh, backed, that if there was any additional funds approved over that that we projected in chapter 70 that we would give that overage to the school budget. Uh, the House Ways and Means Committee came out in mid-April when the Finance Committee was finalizing their budget and they recommended an additional for Arlington $171,110. Now at the time, of course, we didn't know if this was gonna pass the House, we didn't know what the Senate was going to do. So what we did was we took that 171,110 and we put it in the Fiscal Stability Stabilization Fund, Article 56. Uh, the House, the full House agreed with the House Ways and Means Committee recommendation on Chapter 70 and we have it under very good authority that um, the Senate will follow that lead. And we're reasonably confident if the House and Senate follow the lead, the governor will sign it. Therefore, our recommendation is to change the appropriation or to add $171,110 to the fiscal 2017 school budget, bringing that total to 57172443 million one seven two four four three. That's 
172-443. Now when we get to Article 56, I'll make that concurrent reduction at that point to balance out the budget. As you can see, my only comments are, uh, as you can see as you go along there, uh, the last three years, uh, the, the town has given the school budget an increase of 6.41% in 2015, 5.61% in 2016, and now recommending 6.72% increase in the school budget. Um, I, I believe this is fairly, this is generous. Uh, it is the most we can afford. It might even be more than we could afford to do. We are trying to help the school budget uh, through their increases in enrollment, which have been substantial over the last several years. Um, if you take a look, though, uh, at what the effect is on the uh, Appendix D, the five-year plan, you will see that it puts us under severe strain, and that strain keeps getting more and more. Um, so we're, we, we're trying to help out the school budget as much as we can, uh, and uh, um, hopefully this will allow them to take into enrollment, count the enrollment, and also uh, continue to improve the quality of education in the town of Arlington. Thank you. Mr. Tosu, do you have that writing for us up here? We never got one. Oh, they were? Okay, we'll look for them. If we don't, I'll find them. Anyone, uh, Mr. Fuller? Thank you, Peter Fuller, Precinct 20. Uh, question and a couple of comments. Uh, first, in the budget book the school committee provided us on page 29 in the fourth paragraph, it says, Part of the budgeted increase is coming from reducing a prior revolving fund balance held by Arlington Community Education. And my question is, is this in a substantial amount of money? And if it's a one-time piece of funding, how do we replace it next year unless it's being used for a one-time expense? Johnson. Diane Johnson, Chief Financial Officer for the School Department. Um, the 250000 that we're proposing to reduce from the Community Education Program is a one-time thought. Um, the, community, the, the Community Ed Department has been um, growing over the years, and we've been reinvesting and allowing them to expand programming, offers to adults and children. Our summer programs have expanded significantly and one of the things that's made it possible for these programs to grow in community ed is that we haven't yet established an indirect cost rate so the school department provides business services for community ed at no charge and so we see this two hundred fifty thousand dollars as a way to collect on all the work we've done for them for quite a number of years okay so is this is a one-time draw out of that fund yes so are we spending it this year on a one-time expense or is it some something that's spending it on something that's ongoing that we're going to have to fill from somewhere else next year? No, we're planning to use all of these expenditures to boost our, our purchase of curriculum materials that'll be a one-time expense. Got it, okay. A um, couple of comments. In last year's Finance Committee report, we were informed that the plan was to step down the annual allowed increase in the regular education budget from three and a half percent a year down to three percent a year which distressed some of us including me because it kind of broke the deal with the voters that we'd made back in 2011 the last time we asked them in an override so i'm happy to see this year that we're going to stay at three and a half percent i think that'll you know hold face with the voters and help us fund the schools to the extent that they need to be um, second comment, I'm happy to see the considerable detail in the school committee's budget book on the funding requests, particularly on the unfunded requests. This is a, a really good way to keep in front of the community what the school committee's vision for what the school should be 
and I hope they'll continue to highlight it going forward so that we know what we are asking for when they ask for more money in the next override. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Nice phone. Ms. Hansen. Hi, good evening, Linda Hansen, Precinct 7. So I just wanted to spend a minute and build on the analysis that John Dice shared with us the other night about the value of an Arlington Public Schools education. Um, he talked to us about the, that we are at the top end of student achievement and at the bottom end of per pupil expenditure. And certainly, you, you know, some of the good things that he talked about was the role of our good, strong fiscal management and oversight and the long-term planning, and that's certainly all very true. But another factor that I just want you to consider is that we also do that by keeping teacher salaries low. Um, on the slide behind you, what I have is just a recent comparison that came out uh, in the Boston Business Journal in May of, of this year about teacher salaries in comparison with our town meeting 12 um, communities. And it's not a perfect way to measure, average salaries are not a perfect way to measure teacher salaries because you don't, it doesn't necessarily reflect the number of teachers on the different steps on the pay scale, but it's certainly a very good rough guide. Um, and what you see here is that Arlington is really um, at the bottom of this list. Um, in terms of our comparison with our neighbors, we're about 7,500 below Winchester, about uh, 18,800 below Belmont, a little over 8,000 below the state average, and 25,000 less than the top tier system, Brookline, which is, you know, again, one of our most comparable communities. So, while Arlington teachers are really proud of the work that we do together with the community, parents, and district leaders, um, with our students in the community, I did just want to point this out um, and mention that teacher salaries are an important factor to keep in mind when thinking of the long-term viability of a quality school system, and that while we're thinking about all these investments to our buildings, we also need to think about the investments to the personnel and the people that staff the classrooms. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Downing? Nope, behind you, yeah. Um, Gary Tibbetts, Precinct 5, and um, I intend to vote for the budget the way it is. And I just had a question. I, the other day I happened to be reading an article in one of the local papers about different grants and stuff that are available. And I was wondering how Arlington pursued them. I found one that really interested me. It's called XQ. And it was set up by um, Steve Jobs' wife. Um, it's a $50 million grant with $10 million sections to each town for um, towns to put in a proposal and um, you know, improve their schools, uh, offers uh, professional development opportunities, technology infrastructure, linked up students with college credits and things like that. And I was just wondering, has Arlington looked at some of these alternative financing things? Mrs. Johnson? Diane Johnson, I'm Chief Financial Officer for the School Department. Um, the school uh, has a grants officer, Ms. Julie Dunn, and she does pursue every grant opportunity she can. Unfortunately, our demographics don't help us in grant seeking. We are not a particularly low income district right. and we're a high performing district. Okay. Um, poor, poorly performing districts tend to be more attractive to grantors. Okay. All right, I just, uh, but we do, we do we look, do look at we it. look. Okay, did we apply for this one? I'm not sure if we applied for that one. Okay, thank you. Sir, yeah. Uh, uh, Brendan O'Day, Precinct 14. You're on. I have a slideshow. Oh. oh. I, I had a question just about, um, that Mr. Tosti had talked about the, the, uh, the difficulties we're going to we're gonna, uh, have in five or six years with the, um, the falling off of the, the budget. 
and the, and the pressure that the um, transferring these funds to the uh, school department has creating. Um, so as they get the slideshow, it's, uh, it's only five slides. Um, uh, in 2012, we passed a, an override. It was a three-year override. Um, immediately, it became a five-year override. Um, and the, the objective was to uh, take money from the funds that came in over the first couple of years, build up a stabilization fund, and then over the next few years, uh, draw that down. Right. Nothing yet. Um, so at the at the end of the first uh, the first period of the override, um, we had a wonderful uh, surprise in that uh, the GIC helped us have fantastic finances. Uh, we saved a few million dollars. Um, we're saving millions of dollars ever since. Um, Mr. Good, do you have it? Okay, that's good. Um, and uh, and that was fantastic. And 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 so. Uh, instead of having a five-year override that was going to end in 2018, we pushed it out just with the GIC. We pushed it out to 2019. Uh, date certain, it was going to be a zero. Um, we're going to have zero funds in the override stabilization fund by 2018. And this is according to the 2012 uh, finance report. In the 2013 report, let's see if it comes up ever. Um, that's okay. In the 2013 report, um, so in 2013 we were supposed to have $10 million in 2014. Oh, here we go. Hey, hey, oh, hang on. Go back. Okay, so the, the happy face, see, I, see why I needed this slide, it has a happy face. Um, <laughs> The happy face is the happy surprise, and the, um, the next star, the sun, the green sun, is the, um, is the goal for the next year. We're hoping that we'll get to that star, okay? And so the next slide, please. So we had another happy face uh, surprise, and the, um, the override stabilization fund got up to, it was supposed to be $16 million, um, but we had a happy face surprise of $2 million, and you'll see that the happy face is around eight. $18 million there. Um, but we saw that it was going to level off to the purple star, and it was, going to be, it was going to be empty by 2019. That was the prediction back in 2014 report. Next slide. Oh. So in 2015, it, it was supposed to be $18 million in the 2016, but actually we got to um, $21 million, which was another positive surprise, the happy face. If you can see the happy face, it's starting to encroach on the words. And um, we're expected to go down $700,000 in that override stabilization fund, going into a severe dive toward uh, an empty fund by 2021, uh, date certain. Uh, next slide, please. Boom. Um, another happy surprise. Instead of going down $700,000, we, um, we, we are going over the words. and. We are at $23 million now in the overhead stabilization fund, which is fantastic. And the question I have is what, where, why the steep, steep dive coming up? This, so we've had this wonderful, all these surprises going up, 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 happy, 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 happy. Um, and we're still going to end in 2021 with zero. So what's causing, what's cause, so my question, I guess, is, What's causing that severe cliff that we're diving off of? And, um, and is this really a severe pressure that we are forecasting? Do you want to go to Al? Al first, then Adam. Do you want to take it, Al? This is the last page of the finance report. If you take a look at, at, at Appendix D, um, We've been focusing on fiscal 2021, I think, for the last two years. We've taken, we, we, we've tried to keep spending under control. The town manager's budgets have been reduced from three and a half down to 
three and a quarter percent the last couple of years. We've taken some of the conservative elements out of our projection, and we haven't had a recession. Uh, we could still have a recession, but uh, we haven't. And so right now, you, you build up the, the, the deficit, so finally we're able to put some more money aside for 17, but then in 18, once that thing starts piling up, you, you get a two and a half million dollar deficit one year, now you get, a, then it goes to a five and it keeps multiplying to that effect. Uh, it's, it's been about the same projection for the last couple of years, uh, and uh, it, it's, it's fortunate now uh, because we have all of these debt exclusions we need to pass. So we're going to have one set of debt exclusions uh, which is going to uh, add about $250 if they pass in June to the average household. We're going to have another debt exclusion two years after that, probably, for the high school, uh, which will probably be at least that amount, maybe more. And then two years after that in 20, we'll have, another, we'll have the override. Um, so it, it's, um, you know, it's, it's not in structural balance. It's been in structural balance, but then it keeps, it keeps going up. The pensions keep going up, the health insurance keeps going up, and uh, we, we've been adding to the school budget considerably. So I, I'm not quite sure, um, you know, it's a happy face if you're only looking at it a year or two out. It's not a happy face if you're looking three or four years out. Oh, thank you. Ms. Weaver? <laughs> Janice Weaver, Precinct 21. Um, I just have a question for someone in the school department about, I feel though the teachers I was always told that teachers don't make enough money for the surrounding community. But a frequent visitor to our office has mentioned that there are other perks that they get that actually do bring them up um, to a comparable position for other towns. I just have a question there, but I have another question after. Dr. Bode? Dr. Brody? Kathleen Bodie, superintendent. I thought you were waiting. I was waiting for your next question. Oh, um, I'm not quite certain um, what you're referring to. Teachers in our district have their salary. They also have health benefits, which are available to all employees in the town of Arlington. And um, one very small uh, benefit is that there is some partial tuition reimbursement when they pursue courses, um, either in pursuit of a master's, though most of our teachers, vast majority have a master's, but additional courses. But beyond that, I, I can't think of any other benefits they would have that would be a considered um, a sal a salary perks. So you're saying that they are lower, have a lower pay scale than the surrounding communities? Yes, that's true. Okay, thank you. My other question concerns the $250 that we're paying for the new um, overrides and everything. Is that per quarter, Mr. Tosti? Um, Mr. Tosti? I didn't think so. It's a little off scope, but what the heck. <laughs> no, that's an, that's an annual figure, and it's only when all the projects get fully done. So, I mean, uh, all the projects don't instantly go like that. Like, the middle school won't even start until uh, June of 18. Uh, so once all the projects are fully implemented, I believe it's approximately $250 for an average single family home. Per year? Per year. Per year. Thank you. Mr. Dunn?
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Dan Dunn, uh, Precinct 21. Uh, I just wanted to make a, I thought, I think that Mr. O'Day's uh, happy face model is really a very interesting one. And it's one that he's uh, shared with me in the past that I've commented and worked with him, or I, mean, I gave him my thoughts on it. I, and I think it is very illustrative of what's been going on. Um, and we have had several good years in a row. And there's a couple things that I want people, that I think are helpful to think about. One is, is that when you build a model like that, you all, like a, you know, a financial model looking forward of the, on, the, on finances several years in a row, you want to think about how your model might fail because you're never going to be completely right. And when you, your model fails, you want it to fail in a way that you're prepared for. You don't want it to fail in a way that is unexpected. And so what that means is that the model that we use is inherently a little bit conservative. It's designed such that if several things break against us, that we don't have to do anything traumatic to the budget. And what's happened over the last few years is we had several things that broke in our favor. So I think the only thing that I disagree with him about is that I would never describe the things that are being talked about as four years in the future as date certain. They're anything but date certain. We talk about them as this is our best guess, but it's a model and it's four years ahead. Um, and the other thing, and in particular, I want to talk about, just mention that the one thing that I think is broken in our favor more than uh, people appreciate is the amount of new building that has happened in town. Because remember, we're limited by Proposition 2.5 uh, on everything that exists. But every time somebody builds an addition or remodels their kitchen or you know, does anything like that, that's stuff that happens um, essentially outside of 2.5. And we use a fairly conservative number for the amount of new building, and only recently have we begun to put that up. So I really appreciate Mr. Day bringing it forward because I do think that that's something that's really helpful for people to understand because it shows how our model is good and how our model is bad. Thank you. Mr. Wagner. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Carl Wagner, Precinct 11. I move to terminate debate on the article on all associated matters. On education budget. Yes. All in favor of terminating debate on education budget, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It is, it is terminated. We have, I'm going to take the um, substitute vote right now on the education budget while we're on it instead of doing it at the end. Uh, Mr. Jones has presented a written substitute motion on 35 presented by Mr. Tosti. It's seconded. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It's a unanimous vote, and I so declare it. That budget is so amended. That ends education and brings us to libraries. Who wanted to talk about libraries? Sir. Okay. Uh, Len Carden, Precinct 20. Um, I understand that last, uh, last summer, for the first time, we had weekend hours at the library. I wondered if we could get a quick report on how those went. Is our library director here? Andrea Nicolai, Director of Libraries. Weekend hours last summer were a huge hit. Uh, there were approximately 400 people through the door each hour and um, a circulation of 1,000 items during those three hours from 9 to 12. So yes, they Great. were successful. Thank you. So I wanted to use this as a point uh, uh, of information about partly what Mr. O'Day was talking about, but also what we have faced as a town when we're making budgeting decisions, because right now the way we do budgeting is we have this formula and everything goes against this formula. Is Are we increasing by 3% or not? And we've been able to squeeze out some really good things like Saturday hour, like summer hour, weekend hours at the library that are really beneficial for the town. And these are things that I think, even if it did push us into an override, we can go to the voters and say, our town really needs this. We, we need to do this. We need to have an override to do this. So I understand you know, the concerns about everybody about when the override is going to be, how big it's going to be, but I, I, we can't let that totally overshadow all of our decision making. So uh, as we go forward with things, looking at the things in the school budget that weren't funded, and there's things all across town that aren't being funded because of these concerns about an override down the road. So I do think we need some balance. I, I would like us to get a little bit away from the formula budgeting and take a look seriously at what we need to do and what we want to do as a town, and then we can explain that to the voters on the day that the override does come. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Seuss.
Jennifer Seuss, Precinct 3. Um, last year I stood up and mentioned that the Friends of the Fox Library has a bunch of money that they are dying to spend. And um, they would like also to have Saturday hours in the East at the Fox Library. And they have the money for it. It would not cost taxpayers a dime. Uh, they would like to do some renovations. And I know that there's been negotiations back and forth, but I'd like to encourage um, the library director and the town to work to uh, spend this money that the Friends of the Fox is dying to spend <laughs> on the Fox Library. Thank you. Can you guys see the spending that money? Anyone else on libraries? Sir. Daniel Jalka at Precinct 6, so I'm also served by the Fox Library, and I was just looking over these figures before Jennifer got up, and as far as I can tell, the Fox Library, Friends of Fox, is the only like community-driven surplus, funding-wise, to the whole library's budget. Is that, is that an accurate understanding? Director of Libraries is going to tell us. Andrea Nikolai, Director of Libraries. Um, no, that's not quite accurate. Um, we get funding from the municipality as well as the Friends of the Robbins Library, the Friends of the Fox Library, and Massachusetts State Aid. And uh, the foundation. Mr. Pardon me. Mr. Moderator, while she's up here, um, if I may ask, is there a reason why the other Friends of the Libraries are not included as a line item here, or am I missing them? I can answer that. So the, the Friends of Fox offset is for Fridays at the Fox Library. The Friends of Fox fund salaries and services at, on Fridays at the Fox. And that's why the Fox Library is open on Fridays. Wonderful. So one of the things I've noticed as a resident of East Arlington is I'm so grateful to have the Fox Library in East Arlington. I'm also very grateful to have the Robbins Library both great libraries, and um, I guess I just am taking this opportunity to say that um, if we have this passionate, you know, quote unquote customer base for the Fox Library, that's obviously, uh, you know, uh, Jennifer said that um, there's some money there. One of the things I've noticed as a resident of East Arlington is as glad as I am to have the Fox Library in my neighborhood, it does feel like a missed opportunity that it's not open more often. And often when I go with my kids and I say, what are we going to do today? Oh, can we go to the library? And, you know, sometimes it works out and sometimes it's, um, they're just closed that day. And it doesn't feel like a totally working, positive use of a town-owned building for that space not to be used as often as it can. So I would encourage anybody who has the power to help make some of those funds go to keeping the library open to do that. So thank you. Thank you, sir. And anyone else in libraries? Okay, the next budget held was retirement. Who wanted to speak about that? Mr. Jamison. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Gordon Jamison, Precinct 12. It won't be long once the slide's up there. So you folks are all providing these slides to them days oh, last ago. Week. Last week, okay. <laughs> I would not I would not do that to Good, thank you. He's too good a man. Mm hmm I'll just pause the clock for a second, unless you got any jokes or something. Did you lose it? Oh, we have a division 2020. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Oh, that's it. Sorry. 
<laughs> I'm, using, I, I, I'm sorry, I just want that one slide. So I wanted to use, so uh, uh, last meeting, um, Ms. Brazil uh, presented the report on Vision 2020, and I co-chair the Physical Resource Task Group, and I thought this was a particularly um, appropriate way to introduce my little short discussion um, related to the Contributory Retirement Board and the retirement uh, allocation that we're going to uh, provide both here and also with the OPED budget that we'll pass later that total about 12.7 or 12.8 million dollars total uh, for a fund that they that the contributory retirement board manages that's uh, uh, north of with that money north of 140 million dollars approximately the same size as the total town budget that's how much they of one year town budget that's how much they have under management so but I wanted to first say um, first off, I think if you read this, that this is a great reflection of what this town meeting, this town has done this year. To wit, we value Arlington efficient delivery of public services, providing for the common good. The benefit from these services and the responsibility of taxation will be equitably distributed amongst us. We'll be known for our sound physical planning, the thoughtful open process by which realistic choices are made by the town, and the various committees involved in the school committee uh, expansion and all those things, I think, really espouse this town goal, which is part of our bylaws. One of the many, each one of the Vision 2020 goals is part of our bylaws, put it back in there in the 1990s. So I think we should, you know, you should all be applauded in the, in the committees that are responsible for this, should all be uh, um, commended for adhering to these things. Now, as far as the contributory time board goes, um, I'll admit that I've been a contentious at a time critical of their actions, but I was um, greatly um, uh, enjoyed a nice discussion with, with a mem board member, Mr. Viscay, who's the comptroller and ex officio member, and Mr. Rich Greco uh, at last meeting on um, Wednesday. And uh, they agreed completely that the open and transparent process, the open process part, which um, it has, has uh, been increased so dramatically by actions of um, all the departments, the town manager, the school department, so that compared to when I moved here 14 years ago, the amount of information that we have available at our fingertips online is absolutely spectacular. And I only want to have that, have that and I look forward to working with Mr. Viscay, Mr. Greco, and the board towards uh, having that be also true for the Contributory Retirement Board and welcome their agreement to that, to the same. That's about it, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Memon. Zarina Memon, Precinct 21. It's granted um, what um, <clears throat> you just said about, Gordon said about uh, all this money and retirement and so forth. I've been involved with mass peace action and we've been dealing with nuclear weapon eradication globally because we feel that that is the greatest threat to humanity it will cause uh, winter, uh, global nuclear winters and environmental problems and so forth. So I'd like to see the retirement funds to be uh, uh, invested in responsible ways, um, also to be considered in divestment of, into fossil fuels like the colleges are doing. So my two cents. Mr. Deist. I move the question on this budget. All in favor of moving the question on this budget, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? That ends the debate on 24 retirement. The next one that held was insurance. Who wanted to talk about insurance? Nobody. Righty, nobody. Next one held was reserve funds. Who wanted to talk about reserve funds? Mr. Jamis Jamison. <clears throat> Thank you, Ms. Ponderator. Gordon Jamison, Precinct 12. Um, the comment on this uh, notes two things. Uh, the increasing it, and I, I, I'm all in favor of increasing the reserve fund. For those who, who are not familiar with the function of the reserve fund, this is part of our annual budget, not the stabilization budgets that is under the control of uh, 
the FinCom. And uh, a number of years ago, I put forth an article to try to increase it. And finally, we have the wherewithal to increase it to something about 1% of our total budget, which is really a very small fund. And they do an expert job of managing it. Um, they mentioned that they've been increasing this to help pay for s snow deficits. Uh, I note also that the DPW budget was also increased, increased in this regard. Perhaps uh, Mr. Tossi or someone could comment on that and also answer the question whether the special ed education uh, f portion of that is also still an active entity th this year. Mr. Tossi, do you have answers to those couple questions? So the question is about the snow is you're increasing this to cover deficits, but you also increase the snow in DPW budget. And is the special education comment there still operative this year? Okay, well, we've been increasing the snow and ice budget uh, by as much as can be done within the three and a quarter uh, limit that the manager has each year. I think we're probably up to about 80%, maybe 82% of the 10-year uh, average, last 10-year average. Um, what we're trying to do here is get off of the constant raising deficits, uh, having to pay for snow and ice with a deficit that we raise on the next year's right. recap sheet. I, I understand. And because we didn't have much snow, unless you're in northern Maine, uh, because we didn't have much snow this year, we didn't have to raise the deficit. So we were able to take that out of the other line item in the five-year plan and put it into the reserve fund. So now we'll be able to fund the snow and ice budget from the reserve fund plus the snow and ice without having to raise a deficit. Now, of course, you know, we could get killed in a, yeah. in a winter. There's always an exception. So I, I think eliminating de operating deficits is always a good thing to do, and that's the reason why we want to raise the reserve fund from the million uh, normal level up to the million 465, which is okay. about 1%. So we have 1% reserve, plus it, it should cover between this and the snow and ice budget, we should be able to cover snow uh, from current year revenues. Thank you. And um, if you look at C1, Appendix C1, um, as Mr. Tosti alluded to, I can tell you this is now the second time I've been able to stand up in front of the meeting over 13 years and point to the line in the lower right-hand corner, about five lines up, where it says snow and ice deficit, and this year, like it was a couple of years ago, goose egg, as Mr. Tosky alluded to. So that means we had a very light year, and we did not, there was only one budget that we can run a deficit on based upon Mass General Law, and that's our snow and ice uh, removal. And I guess the special education stuff is not operative this year. Right. Correct. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, while I'm up here, since it's related to the FinCom to, to conserve time, uh, many years, over the last many years, um, the concept, and it's usually mentioned in the FinCom report, although I don't know it was mentioned this year, the concept of our structural deficit, which uh, addresses Mr. O'Day's uh, issue that he was raised earlier, was quoted at being two, two and a half million dollars. I think with all the new growth and other, other growth of revenues, Perhaps over the next year that needs to be uh, re-examined. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Anyone else on the reserve fund? Seeing none. Water and sewer. Who wanted to talk about water and sewer? There's no, I had a hold on water and sewer. None? Okay, move on. Ed Burns Arena, someone had a hold. And that's it. We've now gone through all the budgets and all the holds. We're going to take one big vote on all of the budgets. All in favor of the recommended vote of the Finance Committee as amended, please say yes. Yeah. Oh, as soon as Mr. Lathwood's ready. Old habits die hard. Point of order. Sir. That's on Article 56. We took it on 35 for the school budget increase. 
The second article I'm looking at his report is Article 56. Okay? Very good. So ready as soon as you're ready, Mr. Lathwood. All in favor to recommend a vote of the Finance Committee as amended, please vote one for yes, two for no. Oh, that was real quick, 20 seconds. You didn't lose the clickers again, did you? There was a computer glitch last week. Uh oh, we'll give Tim 20 seconds. Do -do -do -do. Okay, here we go. All right, let's do it the old-fashioned way while he figures it out. You want to wait? <laughs> no. All right, all in favor of the recommended vote of the Finance Committee, as amended, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It's a unanimous vote, and I so declare it. <laughs> that closes Article 35, brings us to Article 36. Sir? Oh, there was. It was a near unanimous vote, and I so declare it. Um, that closes Article 35. So, did you make that correction, Mr. Clerk? It's a near unanimous vote. Um, Article 36, Capital Budgets. We have before us a recommended vote of the Capital Planning Committee and the Finance Committee. Mr. Foskett. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Charlie Foskett, Precinct 8, and uh, Chairman of the Capital Planning Committee. Article uh, the article that's before you is Article 36 in the uh, Finance Committee report. That's the official article that's before you. This is also um, described in the, in the uh, Capital report that was uh, pr provided to you at the back of the room. How are we doing? Good. Thank you. So the fir first thing I'd like to do Not working. Is this? Is this? Can I just say next slide and change? Yeah, the sure. Okay, thank you. Next slide, please. This is just the, the topics that we're going to uh, discuss briefly tonight. The the um, uh, membership of the Capital Planning Committee, uh, projects completed in progress, major projects in the five-year plan, Community Preservation Act, the debt exclusion vote, and future debt, vosion, debt, future debt burdens, and uh, our recommendation on the capital budget. Next slide, please. So uh, this is a list of the members of the Capital Planning Committee, and I'd like to ask them to stand as I read their names. I know that some of them are not here. Stephen Andrew, Sandy Pooler, uh, Michael Morris, Richard Visquet, Tony Lionetta, Eve, uh, Eve Margolis, I know is not here, Diane Johnson, uh, Brian Rerig, and Barbara Thornton. These people start working um, in September, and normally they finish up in January or February. This year they work almost uh, right up to this town meeting. And uh, I want to express my thanks for their strong efforts. Thank you. <laughs> Next slide. The uh, slide behind me here just shows a list of uh, projects completed and in progress. Actually, um, in the report of the Permanent Town Building Committee, you heard about some of these and s saw some nice pictures of the Central Fire Station. Uh, also, the uh, Spy Pond Tennis Court reconstruction is complete. Uh, we've completed the planning phase of a new voice over IP system for telephone um, communications in the town. Uh, there are extensive roadway projects underway, and we have the ongoing 40-year program replacement of Excuse water and sewer. And there are also other projects underway, which I'm, you can see on the slide behind me. I'm, I'm not going to uh, go through them all, but I will note that the construction and the renovation of the Stratton uh, is, is underway. Uh, next slide, please. 
The major projects in the fiscal year 2017 to 2021 plan include the Stratton School renovation, which you voted at the special town meeting in January. We also plan a major uh, renovation of the DPW facility, which is uh, near the high school. Um, we're looking at uh, planning and improvement of uh, the senior center and other buildings in the specific block area. Uh, there'll be some improvements in the rolling stock of the fire department, ladder number one uh, is being replaced with a uh, new tower unit. That's a unit where there's a little pedestal on the top of a tower that a, a firefighter can stand in when he's working. Um, the, we are replacing, this question came up earlier in town meeting, we are replacing the town receivables package both with money that the town meeting previously voted and which is uh, voted in this capital plan. We have a continuing investment on the order of $400,000 a year in educational IT programs and that's planned to continue through most of the five-year fiscal plan. You'll also see a big jump in investment in sidewalk repair. We're trying to get that number up to about $500,000 a year. It, we've uh, met it in some of the years in the five-year plan, but not every year, and um, uh, upgrades to the Ed Burns Arena. Next slide, please. Uh, we just wanted to say a word about the Community Preservation Act Committee. The, the, the CPAC invited the Capital Planning Committee to attend the presentation uh, on their project review and recommendations. Uh, we found both the, the CPAC process, which is in its first year, to be uh, excellent and the recommendations to be of high, high merit. So the, while, while this uh, Community Preservation Committee will independently report to town meeting, the Capital Planning Committee uh, urges your report uh, of their, your support rather, of their recommendations. Next slide, please. So um, the Capital Planning Committee did not take a vote or take a position on any of the specific uh, projects, expansion of the Arlington High School or the elementary school programs or Minuteman, because a uh, town, uh, as provided by the bylaw, set up special committees to uh, study and re make recommendations uh, on those programs. And some of them have already been voted at this town meeting. But without, any, without endorsing any specific uh, authorization, we do recommend that if authorizations are made in, uh, by town meeting, that they should be excluded in the debt exclusion on June 14th because the magnitude of these uh, debt uh, authorizations and the debt burden on the town exceeds the ability of the town to pay for these within um, Proposition 2 and a half. Next slide, please. Within, inside the limits of Proposition 2 and a half. The slide behind me, um, just as a little bit of a cautionary note, shows the increase that we see coming up in the total debt balances as we go forward towards fiscal year 21. In the past, the, 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 um, the balances have been along the, the lines of um, less than, less than $100 million a year. And we see this growing to uh, in excess of $200 million uh, outstanding debt, uh, not per year, but total outstanding debt. And um, we have to think carefully about how we do this and how we fund it and what our future budget looks like because this can have two effects. One, it can affect our, our uh, debt rating by the rating agencies, which might affect how much interest we have to pay in servicing the debt. And secondly, um, you know, every, every expenditure is only $75 per household, but if you have enough of them, it gets pretty high and we run the risk of uh, voter fatigue at some point or taxpayer fatigue. Next slide, please. This uh, final slide is just a, a summary of the five-year plan, and I just want to point out that um, under the guidance of the Finance Committee, we try to limit our expenditures to within 5% of the um, adjusted non-exempt budget, and you can see uh, we're at 4.99% in fiscal year 17 and 4.97% over the entire five years. So uh, we respectfully ask for your favorable action on the capital budget as presented in Article 36 of the Finance Committee Report. 17 seconds to go, thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Leonard.
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Leonard, Precinct 17. Just a quick couple of points, if I may. Uh, on page one of Exhibit 5, uh, under Health and Human Services, it's Senior Center Feasibility Study. We appropriated $25,000. My question is, was that study ever done, and where could somebody go to see the results of the study? Mr. Chapterlain. Adam Chapterlain, town manager. The study was performed. It's in draft format, has been provided to me and the director of Health and Human Services. Final copy should be available to the public and the feasibility study committee probably within the next week or two. So we will we'll certainly have that posted on the town website. Thank you. Um, Mr. Moderator, exhibit five, page three of four, sidewalks and curbstones. Mr. Foskett just mentioned about the figure of $500,000 going to be appropriated in 2017. I wonder if somebody could answer how that, if it's roughly how that money would be distributed in regards to the town with like, would it be more so for the business, the residential area? Would it be more so for repair? Would it be more so for new? Or would it be just scattered all over the place? Mr. Rademacher? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Mike Rademacher, Director of Public Works. Uh, some of the funds will be used in a um, different manner. Some will be to uh, assist in paving projects to repair sidewalk uh, damage uh, as con in conjunction with those. And other uh, portions of that funding will be used to repair sidewalk as standalone projects in areas of um, a higher need where we've determined there's a greater population um, utilizing a particular sidewalk that is uh, in bad condition. So we're going to go through an evaluation process to do best allocate those funds. So it could be spread around the three main parts of town. Correct. Thank you. And lastly, Mr. Moderator, on that same page with Public Works Property Division, Town Hall Renovations, if I'm reading this right, it's basically saying $100,000 is appropriated for 2017. I wonder if somebody could tell us what those renovations would be. Mr. Chapterlain. Adam Chapterlain, town manager. Uh, the approach for town hall and the capital budget, uh, a little different than most of our project, has not been one large renovation project, but rather putting a certain funding amount in the capital budget over a number of years. For 2017, our top priority is to go out and design and then hopefully implement a resetting of the stones in front of Town Hall uh, to make a safer, more accessible uh, entrance to Town Hall. I wonder, Mr. Moderator, maybe through the town manager or somebody else, could, on more than one occasion this past winter, employees of the town hall were forced to work under certain conditions that they had no heat in the building. They had to actually work with their coats on during the course of their eight hour day. I wonder if some of that 100,000 could possibly go to solve a problem that existed that maybe they will not be forced to work under those conditions in the future. Mr. Chapterlain. Adam Chapterlain, town manager. I don't remember if we kept people here in a cold building all day, but I know there was a day where the heat didn't work and we had some decisions to make, but we, we can certainly see if any of these funds are available to allocate the necessary HVAC upgrades. That's a, that's a, a fair recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Motoran. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ms. Stamps. Susan Stamps, Precinct 3. I had a question about the, on um, Exhibit 1, the page 2 of 3, under Public Works Property Division, it says, DPW Facility Architectural Design, $1 million. Um, 
And um, I'm just wondering what the plan is for the DPW facility. Mr. I've talked to several people at town meeting. Nobody seems to know about this, so. Uh, Michael Rademacher, Director of Public Works. Uh, within the past few years, we had a study conducted of the facility to determine um, the condition and necessary improvements to bring it up to code. Uh, it highlighted a, a significant amount of repair needed, and this $1 million will you be used to do the design to design those repairs. Are there any um, projections as to how much the project would ultimately cost? Uh, currently, right now, in the capital plan, in the five-year plan, in three or four years out, is $10 million. But once the design is complete, uh, I imagine that number may change. All right, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Jameson? <clears throat> thank you, Ms. Moderator. Gordon Jameson, Precinct 12. I have two questions on the components of Table 1. Um, I'm sorry to ask Mr. Foskett again. What are the antenna funds and the, the Ed Burns and the, um, I guess, urban renewal? And my particular, my question is, can any of those funds, are any of those funds required or can they be used for renovation of parks and playgrounds? Mr. Foskett? Antenna funds, well, obviously the Ed Burns rink, I don't know where the adjustment comes from. And any of the other items listed there that, that offsets, can those offsets be used to fund playground or, or recreational uh, re refurbs? So the antenna funds are used for uh, parks and recreation. That's the only use that they're allowed to be used for. Okay. Um, the uh, adjustment for Ed Burns is the, the Ed Burns Arena is a um, enterprise fund. Okay. And, and the arrangement that uh, we have in general with the um, Recreation Department and the Ed Burns Arena Enterprise Fund is that they pay 50% of the debt service out of their retained earnings and the town pays the other 50%. Okay. Uh, it's not retained earnings, but whatever the proper term is for the surplus in the enterprise fund. So Mr. that adjustment is, the, is their contribution to the debt service that we're carrying in the budget. Okay. Uh, Mr. Moderator, if I may, a follow-up question on antenna funds? Yes, sir. Um, at least as new expenditures, I don't see that level of funding be applied to the parks this year. The um, substantial portion of what we would normally spend on parks and recreation qualify for Community Preservation Act funds. Okay, so you, you bring up my next so question. So we, we have, can I answer yep. the question? Yes. Okay, so, so what we have uh, done is, is identified all the Community Preservation Act uh, qualified requests and have the, determined to wait and see what the Community Preservation Act Committee makes in terms of uh, decisions and recommendations. The funds that you see here um, being sp are, are defraying uh, bond costs for Recreation Department expenses that have been previously incurred. Okay. So um, this, you, you raised the question that I raised last year for, for me, Mr. Foskett, and I thank you. Um, so I, um, last year, I expressed my, my discontent with the time that it's taken for some of these parks and re re uh, recreation areas to be renovated. Um, I am very happy that the CPA plan a proposal does finally, after many, many, many years, um, uh, over the maybe as much as 10 years, uh, schedule the Robbins Farm second uh, portion of that to be renovated. However, I am greatly distressed um, that no, that the capital plan is not seeing fit to allocate um, in parallel the renovation of a different park or a recreation facility. Um, I, I did not vote personally for the, for the CPA in, in its recreation component and all the other wonderful components to have it be used as a way for the capital plan to defer costs I believe they should be committing to I voted for it as a way to augment the capital plan. Um, and so I hoped that the capital plan, the town manager, uh, and all the people required uh, involved in, in formulating the capital plan 
will consider um, very strongly uh, these comments. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, sir. Ms. Memon. Serena Memon, Precinct 21. I have a question for uh, you, Mr. Moderator, to Director, who you would like. I'm glad to see the fire station was built in 2015. It's six million dollars. But I had a question about the water heaters that are constructed in there. I was wondering if somebody could address that for me. Do you want me to just ask the question? Say, can you repeat the question one more time? I had a question about the water heaters. Um, can somebody tell me the details and what decisions were used, what um, criteria were used to put in three water heaters for the fire station? I believe there are three when I took a tour, two uh, tanked and one tankless. Do you know anything about that, Chief? Uh, Bob Jefferson, Fire Chief. I'm not exactly sure of your question, but as to the best of my knowledge, there's one water heater in, fire, in Central Fire Station. When I took the tour, they were given, they showed me tanked as well as non uh, tankless. So, do you have a tankless or a tanked water heater? We have a tanked water heater, one oh. tanked. And then there are two, um, what's the term, Adam, on the heat is, um, yeah, what the boiler's called? Condensing boilers, two condensing boilers, redundant. Okay. Those are the things that are hanging on the wall that may look like okay. tankless so water heaters, but the, there is one water heater in that building. That was inf information I was given by your tour, so I was just going on that. Thank you. Thank you. Not you personally, but somebody at the bar Mr. Fisher? Uh, Andrew Fisher, Precinct 6. I live on Lombard Road, and again, uh, a couple neighbors keep asking me when the um, concrete bleachers along Lombard Terrace for the baseball fields at Spy Pond Field are going to be renovated. Is that going to be under the capital plan? Is that how that will be financed when it someday happens? And is there any plan for that? Mr. Chapdelaine? Adam Chapdelaine, town manager, um, the uh, public works director, Mr. Rademacher, and I uh, have been working and discussing uh, th those bleachers and actually that, that whole area uh, in its entirety. There has been an assessment performed, and we're working to have an application ready for the Community Preservation Committee for this upcoming cycle next year. Thank you. Mr. Fuller? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Peter Fuller, Precinct 20. Uh, two questions. First, on page 8 of the committee's report, it mentions uh, under Stratton financing plan expected asset sale contribution $1 million. I believe this is the former Veterans Hall at 1207 Mass Ave that the town owns. And I wonder if you, through you, Mr. Moderator, someone can explain how that sale is going. Mr. Chapdelaine. Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. Uh, the Board of Selectmen has authorized the town council and myself to draft an RFP. Uh, we hopefully will have that back before them at uh, probably not their meeting this next Monday, but the, the meeting following that in early June. We'll put an RFP on the street uh, and hopefully be able to have uh, some competitive offers back uh, in July. It'll take us a little while to actually finalize the transaction, but we're, we're hopefully within striking distance now. Okay, thank you. Is the $1 million figure a reasonable amount to expect for the sale of that building and land? Uh, so based on past appraisals and then some conversations with um, some realtors in the area, we set um, a bottom line price, the Board of Selectmen set a bottom or minimum price to put in the RFP of $750,000. But based on the fact that one of the adjoining parcels uh, is also either currently or soon to be for sale, I think the redevelopment opportunity could make it an attractive parcel for someone. Good. I'll cross my fingers and hope it happens soon. <laughs> Thank you. Um, second question on in part one of the actual recommended vote, line 40, it earmarks $120,000 for photocopiers in the schools. There's also, I think, $75,000 in the school budget for copiers. I wonder if, if it could be explained how these two things relate to each other, why it's not all in one budget or the other. Ms. Johnson? Uh, 
Diane Johnson, Chief Financial Officer for the School Department. I would love to have the capital budget pay for all of it, but that was a battle I gave up several years ago. Um, Never give up. We presently, <laughs> we presently have about uh, 41 photocopiers throughout the building. We're about to go into a new contract cycle, and we're doing a pretty intensive analysis to figure out exactly what we need and where we need it. Um, photocopying is a much larger part of education than it was in the past because there's so much open source material available on the web. Many teachers take advantage of that. Rather than go with a workbook presented by one publisher, teachers can surf around and find the exact stuff they want and print it out, which puts a much greater strain on the photocopiers than in past. So instead of our need for photocopying going down, it's increased. Our photocopiers also scan and they allow us to print. So rather than using inkjet printers, which are very expensive on a per page basis, our photocopiers are much less expensive. And the teachers have secure printing where they can send a print job to the printer, to the photocopy machine, and it doesn't print out until they go and enter a code into it so somebody else doesn't pick up their print job. So they're very essential pieces of equipment for the schools. And we do spend a lot of money on them, but we use them every day. Yes, well, I, you know, I hang around Dallin a lot, and I do see people waiting in line for the copier, so I agree we need more and more better copiers. So thank you. Thank you. And thanks to the committee for all its good work. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. This woman way in the back, second row. Yep. Danuta Forbes, Precinct 10. Um, thanks to Susan. She answered most of my questions, but then I heard in addition to the one million for the DPW, there's another 10 million coming. Is that correct? Mr. Foskett. Oh. I have exhibit five, Public Works Property Division. And I see the $1 million DPW facility architectural design. And then Mr. Rademacher mentioned that later there's going to be another $10 million. Adam? Charlie, I think Adam has an answer for us. Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. So on exhibit two, page five of seven at the top of the sheet, you can see that in FY17, there's $1 million proposed for the DPW facility architectural design. Then right below that, you can see DPW facility site improvements. And follow that across, and you'll see the $10 million figure in what would be FY, there's no labels here, but FY20, I believe. So what you see, um, as Mr. Rodemarker described earlier, is a $1 million funded for the actual architectural and design this year, and then uh, a budgeted amount of $10 million for the actual construction project in FY20. Okay, um, that actually gives me a little pause. Because <laughs> as you know, soon we're gonna be going through the high school feasibility study, and we're gonna be deciding do we wanna renovate the high school, or is it possible to do a teardown, which tends to be cheaper? And it just struck me, and maybe you can answer this for me, the TBW site is a really great location, and we have other parts of town that also could be renovated and fixed up. So have you thought about moving the DPW to maybe a different part of town and saving that site for a possible rebuild for the high school? Uh, we've, we've had, I'd say, light discussions about that, but we've, we've been unable to identify any viable site for DPW in, in town. I mean, we, you know, we're, we're five and a half square miles, as dense as they come. Um, to, to some degree, I'm sure those in the neighborhood might not agree with me, but there is a DPW facility there today. It's sort of a known quantity. Uh, you know, locating it in another neighborhood that's not had a DPW facility would be a heavy lift. And, and even saying that, I'm not sure where exactly we find that site. Well, would it be possible to swap the site so while the high school is being rebuilt, you could you could rebuild on that right by across from the tennis court? It seems like a great location, or part partially, and you could split up some of the high school property for the DPW. So you could maybe stay in that area, but you could utilize that space instead of renovating it once and then you're kind of stuck with the high school where it is. I guess the, the best I can say to that is when we go through the high school feasibility study, if reusing that space is viable and there is another place where DPW could still operate from, the feasibility study for the high school would allow us to consider that. But I, I don't think we can discount sort of the critical nature of DPW being to operate throughout and 
you know, any disruption to DPW service, especially in the winter, can sort of be a town shutdown type situation pretty quickly. So we, we need to make sure that throughout whatever project, there is a DPW facility that's up and operating. And I'd love to see online maybe some of the plans because, you know, a lot of us haven't been in there, so we don't really know what it looks like inside. Yeah, no, that, that's fair. Okay, thanks. Mr. Foster, did you have something to add to Mr. Chapdelaine's answer? I just wanted to mention that the DPW site has been the uh, location where there's many, been a lot of uh, truck and vehicle traffic over the last, uh, I don't know, 40 years. And uh, as a result, there's some contamination in the ground, which makes some of your proposals more complicated. Oh, okay. So would that mean we couldn't rebuild or build on that site of high school? Or I don't know. I'm just saying it's, it makes it more complicated. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. This gentleman over here in the blue shirt. Yep. Pass. Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9, motion to terminate debate on all items under this article. Motion to terminate debate under all uh, items under Article 36. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. Debate is terminated. Okay, we have before us a recommended vote of the Capital Planning Committee and the Town Manager, there's three separate votes. We're going to take each one serially because one of them involves bonding. Are you ready over there? Yeah, we're going to vote each one separate. Uh oh. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I'll take the first two voice vote because they're not bonded. And the third one is bonded. Can you get, the, are you, okay? Are you ready on all three? Okay, so get ready for the third vote. That's gonna be with the clickers. We have for us a recommended vote on the vote number one for $11,192,533. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? That's, a, that's the affirmative vote and I so declare it. That ends up vote one. We have now vote two. Recommended vote of uh, my gosh, I think it's uh, three million three hundred thirty thousand. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? That's a unanimous vote, and I so declare it. Okay, this one's now for bonding for four million eight hundred thirty thousand seven hundred ninety-four dollars. You all set there, Mr. Lathwood? Okay, all in favor of the recommended vote of $4,830,794, please press one for yes, two for no. This is bonding, so it has to be a two-third vote. It's an affirmative vote, 193 in the affirmative, four in the negative, it is also Pass it to two thirds. And let's see. We have the recommended votes under number five. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It's a unanimous vote on number five. Number six, all in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? That is also a unanimous vote. That closes Article 36, brings us to Article 37. Um, we're still borrowing authorizations for pr previous years. Town hereby rescinds 192,000 some odd dollars. This requires a two thirds vote. Mr. Lathwood, are you ready? Does anyone wish to discuss this? No. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It's a unanimous vote, and I so declare it. Now we're going to take our. The, um, did you call for a vote on item number four under the capital? Oh, on the four, I thought I got. The one, two, three, that was the far oh. Number four, I did not see number four. We're going to go back into article number 35. I'm sorry, everybody, Mr. Costi, good catch. Um, back under article number 36, number four. The town is authorized and directed to apply for blah, 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 to get grants. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? 
That is also unanimous vote, and so declare it. I said, I said on, on number four, that is also unanimous vote, and I so declare it. That now actually does close Article 36. We just did Article 37. Let's take our five, seven minute break. And then we'll come back and we're going to pick up with Article 38. Article 38, appropriation from UGAR property application, some $25,000. Anyone wish to discuss it? If not, you all set, Mr. L oh, well, someone does want to discuss it, sir. Alex Bilski, Precinct 2. Uh, I've had several neighbors ask me what the current status is of the Mugar property, and I was wondering if uh, anyone from the town could give us an update. Mr. Chapdelaine. Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. Uh, I suppose uh, the best update is that, uh, as I think most would know, that uh, Oak Tree was granted their project eligibility letter by, by the state, by Mass Housing. Uh, and what the expectation is, is that they would next be filing with the Zoning Board of Appeals uh, for their 40P or uh, 40B or comprehensive permit application. Uh, it was reported, I just think this past week in The Advocate, that uh, they are stating that they will be contesting the town's uh, calculation that we are at the 1.5% land mass criteria that would exempt us from 40B. Uh, but to my knowledge here tonight, they've not yet filed anything with the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, procedurally, what they would do is file with the Zoning Board of Appeals. The Zoning Board of Appeals could choose to then declare uh, that we were at 1.5% and either choose to deny or make alterations to their requested permit. They could then challenge that to the state, to DHCD, and then to the Housing Appeals Committee. But to date, they have not officially filed with the ZBA. And uh, do they have a certain time limit to get their application in? I'm let town council Thank you, Mr. Heim. Doug Heim, Town Council. No, the, 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 in terms of their actually filing uh, a f application, uh, there's not some sort of pressing time limit on them. All the relevant timelines trigger once they file that application. Thank you. Anyone else under this article? Mr. Fuller. Thank you, Peter Fuller, Precinct 20. Um, usually spending articles like this have language saying something like, said some to be raised by the general tax and expended under the direction of the town manager or whatever. So where's the money come from and who controls it? Mr. Tosti. Good catch. Uh, we could, just give me a sec. Uh, if I could add the word said sum to be raised by general tax and exp expended under the direction of the town manager as a correction to the, as a addition to the FinCom vote, Mr. Moderator. Um, do you need that in writing, Madam Clerk? Yes, you could just have someone write that out, please, so Stephanie can have it. But we'll take that and you can hand it up afterwards. So all in favor right, of that motion, you. please say yes. Yes. Opposed, that motion is so amended. He raised. He's going to write it out for us. Okay, so anyone else in this article? So we've just amended the article. So all in favor of the article as amended, Mr. Lapwood. Ready? And uh oh. Oh. Well, we get a quick clock this time. All in favor, please press one. Opposed, press two.
It's an affirmative vote, 173 to 6 in the negative, and I so declare it. That closes Article 38 as amended. Article 39. Uh, Recommend the vote of the Finance Committee of no action on Article 39. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. It's an affirmative vote of no action on 39. I so declare it. That brings us to Article 40. Mr. Tosti. There were two articles basically the same, one in the annual town meeting and one in the special town meeting on the expenditure. Uh, this town meeting took action on the expenditure uh, under Article 3 of the special town meeting. Therefore, the Finance Committee recommends no action on Article 40. I have a second. All in favor of no action under Article 40, please say yes. yes. Opposed? It's a affirmative vote of no action, and I so declare it that. And Article 40 brings us to Article 41. Uh, appropriation financing water and source. $800,000 for water and source requires a two thirds vote. Anyone want to discuss it? Mr. B Mr. Warden. Uh, John Warden, Precinct 8. I just wanted to um, uh, clear the air because there has been some concern about uh, if, if we have any of those lead pipes transmitting water into houses and if that's, uh, if there is any and if, if so, is it be taken yeah. care of under this, this article? Thank you. Was there a question there? Um, do you have a, go ahead, Mr. Rademacher. Andy O'Brien, yeah. Uh, thank you, Michael Rademacher, Director of Public Works. Uh, we have been reviewing records uh, in Public Works to determine the extent of potential lead services. There, it's fairly inconclusive, but from our work in the field, as we have replaced water lines in the past, we find very few, if, if no, actual lead services. M m occasionally, there'll be a lead connector here or there, but we have not come across um, any or a significant amount of lead services. That being said, uh, the town is soon to undertake a, a water meter replacement program where we will be entering homes to replace meters. At that time, we will be doing a survey to determine uh, if we have lead services in homes that we are now not currently aware of. If that is the case, we will then begin a program of replacing those services. Does that answer your question, sir? You're welcome. Mr. O'Brien. Uh, Andy O'Brien, Precinct uh, 16. Um, just to uh, kind of extend the question, uh, you know, is also in the news, uh, Boston schools uh, recently, they found lead in the schools. I was wondering if we've tested in our schools Dr. Brody. We are in the process right now of applying for money to do more testing um, and working with the uh, director of health services on this project as well as our director of facilities. Um, we, there's been some testing um, over the years and we're um, looking at exactly which uh, buildings we need to test at this point. But yes, we are moving forward with that um, expeditiously. Thank you. Um, anecdotally, anecdotally um, a couple of years ago, I worked for a large uh, water filtration company. And uh, before every installation, we would uh, test the water before the installation and after. And Arlington was probably the in terms of you would test for uh, total dissolved solids, and for total dissolved solids, Arlington was amongst the lowest in, in the state, roughly about 85. Uh, but we did, never tested for any individual um, element, compound, uh, or chemical, uh, but, and lead typically, you, you would test in parts per billion, uh, could be dangerous in, in those levels. Um, so I would 
be pretty confident that we're probably pretty good, but you, you never can tell is because Boston's an MWRA town and their water tends to be very clean. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Wagner. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Carl Wagner, Precinct 11. Uh, to extend Mr. O'Brien's extension of the um, warrant article, I just wanted to very briefly say I lived in East Arlington uh, 10 years ago. We had our water service tested both uh, at the start of the morning and after uh, some time had gone by, water had run, and we found that there was quite a bit of lead in the water when we started in the morning. That means that if anybody's listening to the, this on TV or in the, in the notes later on, um, while I think water supply in Arlington is fine, uh, those of us with old pipes, which is most of us in old houses, should be concerned about the first uh, water in the morning. Thank you. Yeah, the, the, we are talking about the sewers, but all these water questions will apply to the next one. We have to go over them again. Mr. Jameson. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Gordon Jameson, Precinct 12, extending on the extensions. Um, this, to my mind, as far as the schools is, uh, is concerned, would be an excellent uh, use of some reserve funds appropriated by the Finance Committee. I think it fits the need, which is an unrecognized um, need at the time of budgeting. And I would hope that, that with the FinCom would see uh, their way to approving those funds so that the testing could be completed by the start of school. And if the um, school committee and superintendent was so lucky to get funding to support it, they could be reimbursed uh, through those funds. Thank you very much. Again, I hope that could be completed one way or the other by the start of school in the fall. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Schleckman. Paul Schleckman, Precinct 9. Motion to terminate debate on all matters under this article. Motion to terminate debate on all matters under the article. Please say yes. Yes. Opposed? The debate is terminated. It's a two-thirds vote. So we have the recommended vote of the Finance Committee for $800,000. Mr. Lathwood, you ready? All in favor, please press 1 when the green light goes on. Opposed, press 2. Bless you. One hundred and eighty eight in the affirmative, one in the negative. It's an affirmative vote, and I so declare it. That ends Article forty one. Brings us to Article forty two. Water and sewer mains. Now we just had all those questions about water. We'll assume we're all set. Anyone else wants to talk about water and sewer mains on anything else? Seeing none, Mr. Lathwood, you ready on this vote? All in favor of one point one million dollars for water mains, please press one when we get the light and two for no. Affirmative vote, it's a unanimous vote of 188 to 0. And so declare it, and that ends Article 42. The next article we have is Article 47. Appropriations water bodies. We have $50,000 for water bodies. Someone took it off the consent agenda. Who wanted to talk about water bodies? Hmm. No one. Mr. Lathwood. All in favor, $50,000 for water bodies, please press 1. When the light goes on, foes press 2. Okay, press 1 for yes, 2 for no on water bodies. <clears throat> It's 
Passed affirmative vote 182 in the negative, in the positive, two in the negative. And I so declare it, and that ends Article 47, brings us to Article 40, let's see, 48 and 49, we're done, 50. It's the next one. 50. Appropriation OPEB. Um, does anyone want to present on this? Have any questions? Mr. Billifer's here if anyone has any questions. Seeing none of the peers were ready for a vote. Mr. Lathwood, are you ready? All in favor, please press one for yes, two for no. It's an affirmative vote, unanimous vote, 188 in the affirmative, zero in the negative, it's a positive vote, and I so declare it. That ends Article 50 and brings us to Article 51. Appropriation Long Term Stabilization Fund. Um, $100,000 into the Long Term Stabilization Fund. Anyone want to talk about it? Seeing none, Mr. Lathwood, are you ready? I'm going too fast for him. Okay, all in favor of the $100,000, please press one for yes, two for no. The two thirds vote required because we're going into a stabilization fund. <clears throat> 190 in the affirmative, zero in the negative, it's unanimous vote, and I so declare it. That ends Article 51. The next article up is 53. Mr. Tosti has arisen. These are funds which the, uh, will be coming from this year's school budget to be set aside in the Special Education Stabilization Fund. The number that has been given to me by the school department is 135,000. 135,000. So that will be set aside in the Special Education Stabilization Fund together with the 200,000 from last year's school budget that you've already appropriated. That money can only be appropriated by this town meeting by a two-thirds vote for special education. Uh, so I recommend to you the 135,000 under Article 53. Okay, we'll administratively add 135,000 into the recommended vote that was blank. Any questions about this? Seeing none, Mr. Lathwood, are you ready? All in favor of putting $135,000 into the Special Education Stabilization Fund, please press one when the light goes on. Okay, here we go. One for yes, two for no. An affirmative vote, one unanimous vote, 186 in the positive, zero in the negative. That ends Article 53 and brings us to Article 55. Use of free cash. I love free cash. $4,537,299. Anybody want to talk about free cash? Mr. Lathwood. Yep. All in favor of free cash, please press one for yes, two for no. <laughs> Took me years to figure out what it was. Hundred and eighty five in the affirmative, one in the negative. Positive vote, and I so declare it. That ends Article 55, brings us to Article 56. Mr. Tosti has arisen.
as I mentioned before you under the school budget uh, we added one hundred and seventy one thousand one hundred and ten dollars to the school budget uh, we now do need to reduce the uh, money going into the stabilization fund the fiscal stability fund to the figure of two million three four nine nine two six two million three four nine nine two six Okay, do we have a second? second? Anyone else want to talk about the stabilization fund? The fiscal stability stabilization fund. Seeing none, we have the uh, motion to amend made by Mr. Tosti. All in favor of the motion to amend, please say yes. 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 Opposed? It is so amended. We now have a force to recommend a vote of the Finance Committee as so amended. All in favor? Mr. Lathwood? Please press one for yes, two for no. An affirmative unanimous vote 191 in the positive zero in the negative that ends article 56 and so declare brings us to article 57 appropriations community preservation fund miss uh, hello Clarissa Ms. Rowe Rowe. and mr. Helmuth um, chair of the community Pre preservation committee and my vice chair Eric Helmuth, uh, Chair, Vice Chair of the Community Preservation Committee. Uh, Mr. Moderator, uh, first uh, we, I move that we consider each paragraph by, denoted by the numbered votes in the recommended vote of Article 57 separately. Uh, just a brief note of explanation. Wait, let me get a vote on that. So we have a motion to set, divide the question, vote on each one of the paragraphs separately. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? We will vote on each one separately. Thank you very much. Okay. Mr. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. We're going to be quite uh, um, fast tonight because you've had our report for a long time. We also had the projects out in the hallway. Um, there are five of us here from the committee. Oh, there are six of us here from um, the people involved in the, the projects. And as you know, next slide, please. Um, there are three areas of concern, open space and recreation, historic preservation, and affordable housing. Next slide, please. You, you will also notice that our projects are um, throughout the town, and we're very pleased with that. Next slide, please. Um, we have carefully vetted um, each project and all the projects that came to us and we've consulted with the people we were supposed to consult with, the Finance Committee, the um, Board of Selectmen, and the Capital Planning Committee. We're very thankful for Charlie Foskett's kind words. And now we'll go right into the five projects. Eric has given me another minute for this. Um, <laughs> we have Robbins Farm Park, the field and ADA um, renovations. These are right near Gordon Jamison's house, so he should be really pleased. No questions, Gordon. <laughs> the um, second project is the Spy Pond Edge and Erosion Control Project. The third project is the Whittemore Robbins Carriage House Rehabilitation. The fourth project is the Drake Village window replacement. As you know, this is a combined um, project with CBDG funds. And our last project is the Kimball Farmer House. Um, we're all here to answer your questions, but I'm now gonna turn it over to Eric to explain the somewhat complicated vote and budget. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Uh, Eric Helmuth, Precinct 12 and Vice Chair of the Community Preservation Committee. Um, if you need a copy of the report, I think most of you have it, there are a few copies on the back table and that contains the recommended vote and also the detail about what we're going to hit very, very light at a very high level with respect to the, the finances, uh, the, the budget and the votes. So um, every year by state law, we are required to spend or reserve 
at least 10% of CPA revenues in each of the three uh, areas, as you can see in the, in the pie chart. Yeah. Um, and um, we've got that included in our vote tonight. The red area is flexible. Those can be spent or reserved. And then um, up to 5% can be used uh, for administrative expenses, as is detailed in the second vote in your report. Uh, next slide. This is in your report. I know that you can't really read it on the screen, but I want to just hit the high points. Uh, the, we are voting tonight on the fiscal year 17 CPA re revenues, similar to how the other major budgets in town, we, we vote in, based on those anticipated revenues. We estimated them conservatively. Uh, the revenues come from two sources. The local 1.5% surcharge on the net property tax after uh, the, um, what's the word, after the exclusions and uh, abatements, abatements, thank you, um, plus a partial state match on the amount that we take in. And this year, it's estimated by the DOR to be 19%. So that's free cash, as it were, uh, the moderator's favorite word. The um, page eight of the report explains the special situation about where the current revenues being collected on the, uh, on the surcharge where those are going and when we can spend those. We welcome your questions if you, if you have them. And I think the next slide then. The budget also, by the way, does show at the bottom of it the cumulative percentages. So if you think about that pie chart, it shows um, what percentage by project area, historic preservation, um, housing, and, uh, and recreation it shows where the, the committee is recommending um, that with respect to the percentages. So about, these, about the votes, you'll notice that we have three of them. And again, the details, all of these are on pages 10 to 12 of your report. Each of the subvotes is explained in the comments, and we'd be happy to answer questions. So we'll take each of those separately. The first vote um, are appropriations. The town meeting makes appropriations. The, the committee can only recommend. So the town meeting signs the checks. Those are appropriations for the five projects that Clarissa just mentioned and are described in detail in your reports. The second vote are, uh, consists of two items, and that funds a reserve for future CPA projects that town meeting can appropriate from. And it also uh, funds an administrative CPA expenses account as well. The third vote is a contingency only. So if the vote on the first vote is affirmative. I need and I will move as a town meeting member to change, to amend the vote that you see in the third vote to no action for reasons that are explained underneath that. But the reason for that is that because of that 10% requirement that I mentioned at the very beginning of my remarks, uh, we have to make sure that we do that. So if any project wouldn't be funded and we fall beneath our 10% threshold for any of the three areas, we need to fix that by at least reserving dedicated funds in that amount so that we don't have to come back for a special town meeting later. So. And that's, that's it. Um, we're here to answer your questions. Um, we have Mike Kerr, Leslie Mayer, Andrew Bankston, and Kathy Garnett is here from the Conservation Commission. If you have any questions whatsoever, Eric, where'd you go? Um, please ask them. Yes. No, it's my Mr. turn moderator. to say yes. Mr. Moderator. That's, I get to call him and ask, he asks questions and I call you back. Yes, thank you. Okay. I guess I'm in a hurry to leave for some reason. <laughs> Sir, in the blue shirt, you're, you're up. I'm blue. Yeah, Clarissa. Go, Clarissa, go aside. He's up. <laughs> uh, Daniel Jalka, Precinct 6. And I want to say, first of all, I'm really happy that our town adopted the CPA. It seems like a good way for us to continue to improve things that are very important to us in the town with the help of state funding that my view is we would be foolish to say no to. Um, I am here representing Precinct 6, and at the uh, community meetup, I had the opportunity to meet Karen Grossman, who is the uh, uh, executive director or something. She's the head honcho in, in uh, Friends of Spy Pond Park, I believe, and I'm a member of that group. I think it's a great group. It uh, represents, I think, a lot of Arlington 
not only from Precinct 6, but throughout the town who recognizes that Spy Pond is kind of a special um, treasure for the town. Uh, it's um, kind of special, I think, based on where it's located. It uh, is something that many people from the town are aware of and pass through. They're going on the bike path into town, into Alewife. Uh, also, people who are coming to our town from outside, from Cambridge, if they just barely even dip into Arlington, one of the first things they see is Spy Pond, something that I think warrants, among many other treasures of the town, warrants um, being protected. And so I'm really glad to see that one of the things that the CPA has chosen to invest, or to try to invest in, is the erosion control. And if you go to Spy Pond Park, it's so beautiful, but if you go there, you can't help but notice um, there are fences around the shore in the park where um, beautiful, charming little signs made by children and designed by children have implored people not to pass the fences, and not to step on the shore, not to erode the shoreline. Um, and that's not really working. I see people over there all the time who are passing those fences and seeming to not be concerned or not educated about the fact that that might be damaging this town treasure. Um, so I think that uh, this is, you know, one of the most modest expenditures as part of this article, but I just wanted to get up as a member of Precinct 6, as a representative of the people who live there, but also for the whole town, I think we all recognize, you know, it's the, it's the high school mascot, uh, I think. Um, and um, our spy ponders, right? Yeah. 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 So I'm kind of new here. I've only been here for five years. I don't know anything except uh, my kids will be going to Ar Ar Arlington High School unless they go to Minuteman, which would also be great. Um, and um, one of the things I learned actually in the Q&A at this neighborhood meetup was that um, this modest investment, this 50,000 give or take investment in the erosion control feasibility study will not only give guidance to the town to understand what it can do to help protect this resource, but as you know, the vast majority of the shore on Spy Pond is not owned by the town, it's owned by private property owners, many of whom would jump at the chance to take common sense measures, I think, to protect this valuable part of their property. And one of the um, at least alluded to advantages of funding this is that the information we get from the professionals who conduct this study will be shared with property owners. So for example, if there's advice to put a certain material at the shore or to plant a certain kind of plant that maybe will, I don't know, I don't know how this works, but you know, things happen, process enzymes happen, whatever, filter out the, uh, filter out the contaminants that are coming into the water. It will be a, an opportunity for the town to, to give um, information to all the people who own that valuable shorefront on Spy Pond. So in closing, I would just like to say, um, Again, I'm really happy that we, as a community, chose to take advantage of the CPA because it seems like it's just a great opportunity for us to get more value than we, put, than we have to pay for. And uh, this and the other parts of the CPA seem like a reasonable way to spend that money. So I encourage you all to vote to um, approve all of the CPA uh, budget. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ruderman. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Michael Ruderman, Precinct 9. Mr. Moderator, what were the administrative expenses for the uh, Community Preservation Committee for the year just concluded? Ms. Rowe? There were none. We um, couldn't we didn't have any money. We won't have any money until you vote on this article, and the money will start on July 1st, 2016. This is the way the law is written. It's very complicated, but we didn't have any money. We had... Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. That answers my question. Thank you. 
Uh, the projects are excellent. I think they're all worthy. They're all uh, you know, more than qualified for uh, the support of these funds. Uh, Mr. Moderator, if the, co if the committee had no expenses for the past year, why is the committee asking for the maximum amount allowed under the enabling legislation, that being 5% or more than $77,000 for administrative expenses going forward when they had no administrative expenses in the last year and still produced this list of very well qualified and, and detailed projects? I got you, Paul. Ms. Rowe? Um, thank you. Uh, we are hoping that this expenditure will keep the kinds of expenses that we actually had this year to a minimum because we've had um, someone from the town manager's office um, doing all the administrative work for us, not paid out of this budget because it can't be. The idea that we could have somebody in the town manager's office overseeing these, hopefully, these five projects in the next year is something that we haven't had to go through yet. The idea for the expenses budget is really to take the time and expense away from the other town budgets and personnel so that it can be um, devoted to just the Community Preservation Act. I believe the answer to my first question, Mr. Moderator, was in the last year, zero. Is that, cor is that correct? Mr. Tosti? Yes, Mr. Tossi is going to tell you, sir. The CPA committee did not have any expenses because they didn't have any money. All the expenses were absorbed by the town. So one of the town manager's personnel had to be there at all the meetings and handling all the administrative work, uh, and the manager's office had to handle that. I believe, in addition, the IT department and the treasurer's department had to absorb all of the uh, software expenses because of the new one and a half percent. So there were expenses. They didn't get paid by the CPA committee. They got absorbed by the town, uh, and the town can't keep doing that. So this situation shall not prevail in the future. Am I correct in presuming that? I would just... The situation of, of other town, uh, town budgets covering the administrative ex expenses. Mr. Helmuth. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Eric Helmuth, Vice Chair of the CPAC. Yeah, as explained in the comment to vote two, uh, the intent of the expenses account is to protect the town budget from expenses that are uh, that come from CPA wherever it is allowable by law, uh, to prevent many of, this, of the situations that that Mr. Tosti just said. Um, the law also says, and I think this was relevant to your to your question, Mr. Ruderman, uh, the law also says that any unspent appropriated expenses account roll back to the general CPA fund. So it will be treated as a reserve fund to be only you only to be used as much as necessary, but to be used as much as possible to offset unavoidable expenses that come from CPA. And those are some of the possible ones that are enumerated into the comment under that vote. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. That answers my questions. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Trembley. Ed. Ed Trembley, Precinct 19. I see there was $200,000 to uh, given to uh, to restore the uh, Kimball House. Um, I'm curious if the uh, 1.4 something or other million dollars includes the purchase price of the house. Ms. Rowe? No, it cannot um, and does not. Like many affordable housing projects, the small amount that the Community Preservation Act funds are going to is one of the many pieces that the Arlington Housing Corporation has used to acquire the house to do the um, the building of the house this is actually the last piece of their construction project and it actually qualifies both as affordable housing and historic preservation but we're putting it down as affordable housing so the, the 1.4 million dollars was the to renovate the house it didn't include the purchase price is that, did I hear you right do you want to, uh, could, um, Mr. Moderator, could Pam Hallett 
come up and answer that question. Yes. If someone has more information for us, that's great. Pam Hallett from Precinct 21, also Executive Director of the Housing Corporation of Arlington. The 1.5 does include the purchase price as well. The oh, okay. 1.4. So, uh, so that uh, 400 and something or other thousand dollars per <coughs> unit is the finished total cost? Total development cost, yes. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Mr. Klein? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Christian Klein, Precinct 10, and a past president of the Friends of Robbins Farm Park. Um, it was 2002 when we first started getting ready for the community build for the playground, which happened in 2003, with Gordon Jameson was kind enough to, uh, to work with myself on organizing that. I carried my one-year-old son in a backpack that weekend while we did the community build. He is entering the high school next year, and the second phase still hasn't happened. So I'm very excited that the funds are uh, being expended or are being proposed for this project and I strongly encourage everyone to uh, vote in favor. Thank you. This gentleman right here in this blue shirt, sir. Phil Goff, Precinct 7. I move to ter terminate debate on this and all matters before. Motion to terminate debate in the article. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It is a majority, it's a two-third vote, and I so declare it. That brings us to the recommended votes. We have three separate and individual votes under this article. We'll vote number one first. All in favor of the recommended vote of the Finance Committee. Please press one. Community Preservation Committee, I'm sorry. All in favor of the recommended vote of the Community Preservation Committee, please press one for yes, two for no. It's an affirmative vote, 171 in the positive, 12 in the negative. Now we have the second part of the vote. All in favor of the recommended vote, as printed in our reports. Please press one for yes, two for no. That is a affirmative vote as well, 171 in the positive. 15 in the negative. Mr. Helmuth, do you want to amend your third vote? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Eric Helmuth, Vice Chair of the CPAC. I move to amend the third vote recommended by the Community Preservation Committee to no action. Okay. Anyone wish to discuss that? We have before us first the motion to amend the third vote from that printed in our report to no action. All in favor of that amendment, please say yes. Yes. All opposed? It is so amended. Mr. Lathwood, are you ready in the recommended vote of no action? All in favor of no action on the third vote, please press one for yes, two for no. As 185 in the affirmative on no action, one in the negative. That ends Article 58. I wish to personally thank the CPA Committee, Ms. Rowe and Mr. Helmuth, for their hard work over the past year. That brings us to Article 59. Ms. Darcy. I got you on the list, Mr. Sch oh. oh, you're going to introduce her? Okay, Mr. Schlickman. Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9. I'd like to uh, introduce Darcy Devney, a resident of the town, to speak on this resolution. Ms. Devney. Okay. 
ready with? Are you ready with the thing? Do we have the Hi, Darcy Devney, Precinct 4. I'm here on behalf of the Arlington Disability Commission. I'm sorry that my partner, who has worked very hard on this proposal, Cynthia DeAngelis, is not able to be with us tonight. She's ill. So, what is Article 59? It's all about an adequate number of handicapped parking spaces in the optimal places. Why is the Disability Commission sponsoring this article? Three reasons, statistics, surveys, and complaints. So for statistics, for statistics um, as you can see, the Massachusetts Disability Commission recommends a minimum of 5% handicapped parking spaces in business areas on street parking. And we looked at various other statistics. No. Um, in Massachusetts, the number of handicapped parking places placards uh, is at, at about 10% of the number of cars that are registered. In Arlington, um, it's at about 6.3%. We also looked at ambulatory difficulties reported to the Census Bureau. And in 2013, again in Massachusetts as a whole, that's 6.2%. And in Arlington, for people over the age of 65, it is at 16% for ambulatory disabilities. So that's statistics. Surveys, uh, you may remember last year's Vision 2020 survey had a page of questions about disability access. One of them was about handicapped parking and the ease of finding it in the various business districts. Um, as you can see, uh, the answer is it was kind of difficult, um, especially in East Arlington. And you can also, if you looked at this year's 2020 survey, the one with the purple cover and back, uh, you can see that increasing the handicap parking at the senior center was one of the top three priorities for 38% of the visitors to the senior center. So we looked at the on-street parking in business districts to count it to see what kind of percent we had here in Arlington. Basically, when we talk about on-street parking in business districts, we're talking from the Cambridge line of Massachusetts Ave all the way up to about Trader Joe's in the Heights. Um, and an area around um, the center that's also considered business that isn't just right on Mass Ave, like Medford Street and so forth. And we came up with about a thousand, more than a thousand spaces. And how many of those were handicapped parking spaces? 23 out of more than a thousand. So that's 2.3%. We looked at the fraction of the HP spaces by neighborhood to see if it got any better neighborhood by neighborhood, and the answer was, uh, again, no. Um, you can see it's still under 3%, and it is, again, in the east, the worst at 2%. Just quickly, we're going to go through. The east currently has four handicap spaces. The center currently has 11. Remember, these are handicapped on-street parking in the business districts. We're not talking about residential. And in the Heights, which is the best, we have a whole eight handicapped parking spaces out of 300 and some odd. So again, if we look at those statistics, we're way below the minimum that we should have according to the Massachusetts Office of Disability. And we are, in fact, quite a bit below some of the statistics that apply to Arlington specifically. So we went and looked at what would it look like if we tried to get up to 5% or more handicapped parking spaces. And we looked at some placement criteria, which is kind of complicated, and you have to go sort of curb by curb, block by block, because everything's different in Arlington. No block is alike. Uh, but we also did a lot of outreach. And our outreach consisted of things like uh, two articles in the Arlington Advocate, of course, we emailed to the Arlington email list, which has more than 5,000 subscribers. We talked to uh, businesses. We've started in the east talking to businesses. Um, and we're going to be talking to, uh, and we emailed to businesses. And the DOS said and unanimously approved. We have outreach planned for the future, which is tables at the Feast of the East and the uh, Town Day. And uh, we're going to do ground level walk shops 
of the three business districts, which means going block by block again and talking specifically to business owners and so forth. Um, and the eventual outcome of this, I hope, is at least 5% um, business district handicap parking. And we're going to have an online parking map, which will include the regular parking spaces and the handicap parking spaces. So anyone who wants to bring their grandmother to Arlington, anyone who wants to visit Arlington can look in advance and see where they can get a handicap parking space to go visit some of our shops and stores. So the goal, an adequate number of handicap parking spaces in the optimal places, you can see why. I just wanted to say thanks to two, a bunch of people, but specifically um, our DPW director, Mike Rademacher, is actually a member of the Disability Commission and he's been terrific on logistics and some real practical stuff. And uh, our GIS director, Adam Karowski, who is the one who worked with the map tools and uh, figured that all out for us and is gonna help us get it online. Uh, that was all the thank you. So, um, questions? Yep. If there's questions, okay. I'll get them and ask you. Okay. okay. I hope you vote yes. Okay. Anybody wish to discuss Article 59? Seeing none, looks like we're ready for a vote. You are all set. Okay. As soon as Mr. Lathwood's Thanks. ready, all in favor of the recommended resolution of the Board of Selectmen as printed in their report, press one for yes and two for no. It's an affirmative vote, 183 in the positive, four in the negative. That ends Article 59, brings us to Article 60. Mr. Leonard. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Leonard, Precinct 17. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Moderator, when Precinct 17 approached the Selectman's Office in January of 2014, at that particular time, we asked about the possibility of going back to the Highland Station. We were told at that particular time, probably not due to the fact that it was not handicap accessible. We found that interesting because we were under the impression that mostly all buildings nowadays would be handicap accessible. We then asked about what about the possibility for town hall. The answer to that was precinct eight and 10 were voting there now and parking might be an issue if another precinct was added. We also found that very interesting, seeing as how that for so many years we've been crammed up in the, into the Stratton School with 13 and 15, two other precincts, and parking up there is very limited. Can't hear him. We then turned around and asked, what about the senior center? At that particular time, we did get a very nice letter from the director of the planning and community development outlining why with all the occasions that are going on at the senior center, it would be very doubtful to have a precinct there. I think at this particular time, it's important to mention that when a precinct is moved from one location to the other, it is required by the state that everybody who is a registered voter in that precinct is to be notified of such a move. We have asked the Office of the Board of Selectmen for a copy of that notice that would have went out in either 2004 or 2005. As of this evening, we have not received anything. It has been two years. 
Another point of information is that when the Pierce School, which housed Precinct 19 and 21, were moved due to the construction for the Pierce School, those two precincts were moved to the skating rink on Summer Street. The skating rink, by the way, is located in Precinct 17. Now, once again, with the Stratton School being under construction and being closed, Precinct 17 is on the move again. We have been notified that Precinct 17 is now going to be moved into the Pierce to be jammed with the 19 and 21 precinct, which is already there. And parking should prove to be interesting. You ask, well, what about 13 and 15? 13 and 15, by the way, are going to be moved to the skating rink on Summer Street, which is precinct 17. Mr. Moderator, in the master plan, the master plan states on page 22 that today the over 55 age group accounts for 28 percent of Arlington's total population and the number of seniors is expected to increase more dramatically. Also in the master plan on page 12, it talks about encouraging more walking in the town of Arlington. It doesn't include, count, as far as I can see, encouraging climbing up the hill to exercise your right to vote. Ladies and gentlemen of town meeting, tonight I request, I urge, and I just ask, could you please support the resolution in front of you and let's do whatever we can to bring Precinct 17 back into Precinct 17. Thank you very much. Mr. Leonard's made a substitute motion. We have a second. Thank you. Um, Mr. Jefferson. Uh, Bob Jefferson, Fire Chief. Just would like to quickly state a few points. Uh, this issue has been discussed at length over the past a year or so. Uh, several memos that I addressed to the Board of Selectmen uh, in regards to voting at the Highland Station as well as appearing at a Selectmen's meeting uh, that Mr. Leonard presented it to uh, to state the reasons why I feel it's not a good solution to have voting at the Highland Fire Station. Um, at that meeting there was a 5 nothing vote um, against Mr. Leonard's um, proposal uh, for a town meeting warrant article to which he, he brought you a resolution tonight. Uh, I really don't want to be the person standing between you and getting out of here on the last article, but just if I could quickly. Um, the reasons that I don't feel it's conducive to voting in the Highland Station is for someone who actually works in that station and knows what that station is about and the conditions in there and why it's not a good station to vote in. Back when they were voting in the Highland Station prior to the remodel, um, I was a house captain down there. I was stationed down there for about 15 years. I worked most of the tours that required us to be there while the voting was going on. Firefighters never minded voting going on in that station. I could sit there though daily and listen to the people there that were there for 14 hours a day complain about being in a garage, about the st smell of diesel, about the smell of oil, about the smell of gasoline about the bells going off, about the horns going off, about the, the people coming and going, about the heat conditions in a garage, which is still the same situation we have today. The Highland Station, although remodeled, is still a garage that houses vehicles. It still has the smell of diesel, even though we have a state-of-the-art um, climb vent system, which takes the diesel exhaust from the, the trucks out of the building, it still has that smell. It still has oil on the floor. It still has, it's a cement floor that's porous, that absorbs those chemicals, and it, it doesn't go away, no matter how often we clean those floors. The floors are not level. They are concave so that the water from the trucks, when they're washed or clean, drains into floor drains that are in the floor. We lost over one-third of the apparatus flow when we remodeled for both 
um, gear storage and for other storage in the building. So now that building that, again, was a voting precinct in the past is now a much smaller area. We, it would be my intention that even if voting was moved back into the Highland Station, that that, that, that station um, continue to operate there, even if it's just for that one day, um, response in the districts that they respond to. So it would be my intention to leave those, those pieces there. We could take the pieces out, hopefully the weather would be cooperative and, and we wouldn't have to worry about freezing of the apparatus or anything, but the people would still be there. They would still exit and in, in, in enter out of the building. Um, the entryway into the building, Mr. Lennon talks about the handicapped accessibility. The entryway into the building, although maybe level, is not um, a very wide entryway and it's not conducive to somebody who may have um, restrictions with their mobility in getting into the building. I could go on and on. I'm telling you as the fire chief, I've been over this, we've researched it, we've met with the Board of Selectmen to talk about it. I would strongly suggest that you vote no on this resolution. Thank you, sir. Mr. Kleinman? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, ironically, I stand to support Mr. Leonard and what the chief said. Um, I'm sorry, can you hear? Oh. The problem that we have, oh, I'm sorry, Stuart Kleinman, Precinct 1. Um, the problem we have is, and I put so in writing that this did not really affect voter turnout, but we don't have enough people that vote anyway. That's the problem. And if we make it more difficult, they won't. And I agree, the fire station should not be used. So I have a minor change, which would be in the fourth paragraph to take out the Highland Fire Station. To so say, so it would read, return the precinct 17 polling place to a venue located within the precinct boundaries. I want to make it easier for people to vote. It doesn't have to be the fire station, but it should be somewhere in the precinct. And uh, thank you very much. Very well. I've um, got a second on that motion. Um, Mr. Moore. Christopher Moore, Precinct 14. I move to terminate debate on the article. Got a motion to terminate debate on the article and all matters under it? Yes. yes. Um, all in favor, please say yes. Yes. All opposed? Okay, so we, the debate's two-third vote, debate is terminated. We have first Mr. Kleinman's motion to amend. Mr. Leonard's substitute motion to eliminate the words to the Highland Fire Station located at 1007 Mass Ave, comma, or. All in favor of that amendment, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. It is so amended. We now have before us Mr. Leonard's substitute motion. All in favor of Mr. Leonard's substitute motion, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. Uh, chairs in doubt, Mr. Lathwood. All, all in favor of Mr. S Leonard's substitute motion, as amended, please press one for yes, two for no. On the substitute, yes, this is to substitute. As amended. It's an affirmative vote, 108 in the positive, 69 in the negative. So we now have the substituted vote of the Board of Selectmen, Mr. Leonard's all in favor of the substituted motion, please vote one for yes, two for no. The recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen as is amended by Mr. Leonard's motion. So we just substituted the recommended vote of no action with Mr. Leonard's substitute. And now we're voting on the final vote. We just voted. We voted Kleiman amended it. Then we voted Leonard's to substitute. Now we're going to rec vote on the recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen as substituted by Mr. Leonard's motion. So if you want to make this motion to 
to resolve that we want to tell the Board of Selectmen they should do this, which is your choice, you would vote one or you would vote two for no. So Mr. Lathwood, one for yes, two for no on Mr. Leonard's substituted motion. It's an affirmative vote, 109 in the positive, 67 in the negative, and I so declare it. Mr. Tosti. <laughs> Who spoke? Yes, sir. You can make a motion to reconsider. Oh, you got to get someone who did. Well, I thought I had explained it. I don't see anybody standing to reconsider. Mr. Tosti, you're up. I move that Article uh, 3 be taken from the table. All in favor of taking Article 3 from the table, please say yes. Yes. All opposed? Article 3 is on table. Mr. Tosti. I move that the annual town meeting be dissolved. All in favor of dissolving the annual town meeting of 2016, please say yes. Yes. All opposed? The town